Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm uh, Rick Adam. So the Twitter handle Rick Adam here, and I have uh, Lars Eriksson with me here. You will present yourself in a little bit of time here. So we're dividing this presentation as uh, according to our roles in this project, I would say then. So I'm the product, like the head of the product for Telia's own, or the head of Telia's own, if you wish, uh, for in, uh, in this capacity. So ca came up with the idea from on, a, on a single PowerPoint, like uh, roughly a year ago, a little bit more than that. And then uh, Lars here is representing the implementation side of the lead technologies. So we'll do both sides uh, in this presentation, because the actual use case is uh, is, I think, equally interesting as the, as the technology, but they can't live uh, without each other, of course. So, uh, Telia, the leading incumbent carrier in the Nordic market. market. We are, uh, like, in the telecom space, you would say that we are the, like a quad play player. So we have uh, both mobile networks and we have the uh, fixed network with enterprise and consumer, consumer play. So, uh, one of the uh, least, well, one of the places where there's been least innovation in our side of the business, according to myself at least, uh, is the broadband side. So on the broadband, I think that everybody in this room at least genuinely understands what this thing does. Uh, that's a router, it does Wi-Fi. So it terminates your Wi-Fi signal to your fiber. And uh, in Sweden, we have a lot of fiber, but we also have ADSL. The connectivity uh, is not important for, for this, uh, this topic, like the back end, if it's ADSL or fiber. We have roughly uh, one million of, of these uh, distributed in Sweden. So we're going to focus this presentation specifically around uh, Sweden. But uh, we will be driving or in, uh, deploying the Telia zone also outside of, of, our, uh, of the Swedish market to our uh, core footprint in the Baltics and the Nordics. So we have a million of these. I saw them as an underutilized asset. We have a really great customer relationship when it comes to TV service. So like roughly 60, 70% of our users uh, also subscribe to a TV service from us. That's one way to interact. But nobody hardly has been innovating and doing things with the router in many, many years. So what we started thinking about is, OK, so let's try to see what capabilities are there in this. So I'm going to take you a little bit on a, the narrative here is from the end user perspective. And then we're going to walk back and end up in technology. And then the last uh, few slides of the presentation is about the future. So the narrative here is how I explain it to end consumers. Uh, and adding to, adding to this is that uh, roughly half of our install base, the subscribers, are 55 years or older. So if we want to make something smart for the home, a smart home platform, which uh, the Telia Zone is sort of, sort of uh, we'll have to abstract it quite a few levels above Neo4j, to be quite honest. It has to uh, be a bit more simple. So we unpacked this router. We thought, OK, so what is inside of here? Could we add something? Yes, I think we can. So dear end consumer, we are adding stuff to your router. We're going to do two things for you. We're going to help you simplify your life and we're going to help you entertain yourself together with others in your home. That, those are the two core value propositions. So how do, we, how do we do that? Well, we do that by introducing services or building services or allowing other companies to build services for you based on a context. So it's very interesting that we had this presentation before here regarding adding context to apps. So this is exactly what we're doing. We are adding the context of the home. So when you enter the home, when you leave the home, etc. We'll come back to that. Uh, we packaged it as the Telia Zone, and we're deploying it, dear users, to everybody in Sweden who has a Telia router. It's neither opt-in or opt-out. This is something that's going to be rolled out to, to everybody, one million, one million homes, roughly. Uh, so the, the idea here is that we want people to be so proud of being a Telia subscriber that they put these, <laughs> like at the end of the day, you, you put the sticker on your, on your mailbox. This is a Telia zone home. So what is it, actually? Uh, instead of explaining this as a technology, because the, at the end of the day, it's a new technology that we've introduced, we are explaining it in terms of the use cases. So uh, from, uh, from this perspective, it's in Swedish now, so I'll uh, translate this for you. Uh, what it says is that, Dear consumer, you're getting a new life to your broadband. So your broadband connection is getting a new life. Uh, and your 
connected home, so the te teleazone is the, is the centerpiece of your connected home, but we're not trying to scare away users by trying to push a connected home platform. Instead, we're saying, inviting them to just start experimenting with our, with our service. So for instance, you can get a message when the kids come home. And this is a, like a magical feature, <laughs> or maybe or maybe not, but for many, I have three kids, this is a really good feature, is that without an app running, without anything running on the phone, you could get an SMS when the, when the kids come home. How about the lights turning on when you come home? How about the music changing when you get home? Or when you leave the home and you forgot to lock the door, how about you, we get, give you a message there and remind you that you forgot to lock the door? Those kind of things is what Teleazone does. We're not positioning this as the be all end all of, of the connected home, smart home uh, platforms. Uh, another example. We built a, a playlist together, a playlist generator together with Spotify. What this, uh, CoPlay is the, is the app. This is the uh, Sonos moment, the 9, 9 p.m. Sonos moment, where uh, if you have a Sonos system and you have a party with like 10 people, the Sonos phone playlist goes around the table and people start, you know, oh no, start changing songs all the time. This is my song, this is my favorite song. How about if we generate that playlist automatically based on who is connected to the Wi-Fi? This is what the, this one does. And it gen generates a playlist in Spotify, which uh, sort of dy dynamically rem removes you if you leave the house. If you come back, it adds your songs again. Like, that's what, it, that's what it does. And on the last part here about the experimentation, we also made a, an IFT channel. So in this room, I suppose the majority of you know what IFT is and that is, or IFT. Uh, for a consumer, 55 years plus, most people don't know what IFT is. But we're trying to introduce this a little bit as a, as a way to experiment with, uh, with your connected home. Uh, the Telia zone is something that lives inside our partners. So we don't have a Telia zone app. We don't have it our own experience. Instead, we are integrating it to inside partner experiences. So these are some of the solutions that we have out there, and they are now in Swedish because we're launching in the Swedish market first. But for instance, glue lock is a, is a knob, that, a smart lock that turns uh, the, the, door, the, knock, uh, the knob on the, the lock, so to speak. Uh, retrofit, this one, this one works with reminders. We have a smart home, uh, smart uh, like Nest thermostat, which is called Manetos, running for geothermal heating and a few others. They are actually curated quite, uh, uh, let's say, like we have curated them to see and calibrate which interest vectors are, are for our customers and what the, what the customers are interested in, let's put it like that. So now I'm getting closer and closer to why we're using a graph, I think, in that sense that we actually don't know yet what the killer use cases are for the Telia zone. And this is what we, why we realized that we probably have to build it as a much more open platform than a closed platform, coming back to uh, getting close to technology. So we have an API today. The API is found on the premiumzone.com. So we're, this is the English-speaking <laughs> premiumzone.com website where you can, as a developer, go in and uh, look at our APIs. We have four APIs. We launched, uh, w this is actually a launch event for today. We're launching the, the last one here. So what you can do with our APIs, we're telling our developer community, is that you can see when somebody comes and leaves the home. So a registered device can come or leave the zone. You get uh, webhooks. Uh, for that. You can identify uh, devices as clients within the zone, and you can get all the other clients that are in the zone. Those are the basic APIs. They might sound like if you're just looking at the slide like this and don't have the context yet, or don't, are not building apps, they might sound not too much, but they are actually building, we have 150, 140 developers, something like that in our system today, doing that. Uh, and the last thing is that you can authenticate clients in a zone. So uh, I, the last one, I think, is super, super interesting. Uh, I'll show you by a use case what is happening here. So this is Spotify. So you're running Spotify as uh, here's the mother. And many times, the children are sharing the account with their parents. So you have the same account. And maybe you have these account battles. What happens when, you, when the kid starts playing? It shows up on your phone. And you get a message that somebody's playing on the same same account here. If you are using the uh, Telia Zone uh, uh, 
home account or authentication, you can actually start proposing things to users that you could never do before. Because you can see the MAC address, the, the register of devices, you can automatically generate new accounts for your users and then later on start filling in the information. So what you can do there is a give, how about giving the fam or everybody in the family uh, a premium account? Okay, let's do that. And then in the back end, uh, back end system, I'm oh, sorry, in the back end, uh, using our API, you can then get access to unique identifiers for every single single device in that, uh, that is connected to this service and generate an account for those automatically and then populate that with information afterwards. So Lars, I'm handing over to you now to just discuss like, how we built this on, on Neo and why, probably. Yeah, so let's get into kind of the technology on how, how this actually works. So first, just a, a, a small rundown of kind of how the infrastructure is built up and how we're hosting Neo. And then we're gonna get back to kind of how we're scaling Neo and what we use Neo for. Uh, so basically, we run everything on GCP, Google Cloud Platform. And what we've done is we've created like a microservice architecture out of Node.js apps. We're using uh, the Neo driver for Node, and we're hosting a kosher cluster within Kubernetes. And we also have some other services around here. This is kind of a, a simplified version of our architecture. But uh, what this kind of helps us with is it's, like, it's really easy for us to scale within Kubernetes. Uh, and it's also really easy for us to upgrade. I actually upgraded to Neo 3.2 just before we went up on stage, uh, in development at least. Uh, so what happens then uh, here, if we have a user connecting, what, it, what is actually happening in the back, on the back end side? Well, you of course connect to the router. Uh, the router sends a message to our back end, uh, to our node applications, where we then distribute the data out to our storage solutions. So what you see here is that we are actually running more storage solutions than Neo. Uh, they have a little bit of different use cases, all of them. Uh, but we're using Cloud SQL to kind of hold the state of all our routers out there. And then we're kind of building the graph on what's actually important to us and what's important to our applications to make good decisions. Uh, then we're also using BigQuery for some time series stuff. Uh, Let's leave that out of this talk. Uh, and what's, what's then happens after we push that into our storage solutions is that we also notify you as a third party with a webhook, webhook saying, this client of yours actually just connected to this zone. Uh, so router is kind of the same thing as a zone in our topology, uh, at least for now. Okay, so what happens then if, if you wanna ask for what clients are in a specific zone? Which, which of my users are in this specific zone? Yeah, so as a third party, you make, you make the request to our API. Uh, we go to Cloud SQL to kind of fetch uh, the current state of that zone. But then we go down to Neo. Uh, and what we want to deliver back to you is we want to deliver back which, which are these users, not only what are these uh, like MAC addresses that we use internally in our system. We want to deliver something more valuable back to you. So we want to deliver the actual usernames or the actual tokens or something that you can use to identify your users back to you. And we have all that information we store in Neo. Um, so we go there, get that information, and send that back to you. Uh, so what you need to do then before we can actually know that one of these users are actually your, your specific, the specific user in your system is that you kinda, first you need to register that user with us. Uh, and this is kind of where we really need the hardware to do this because how we identify a user is by the MAC address firstly. Uh, and what you do then is you make an API request from within a zone and what we can look at when you do that request that goes through uh, the router and we can look at your IP address, and we can know which the MAC address is. And we can append that to the request going up to our backend. Uh, and before you've done this, uh, we won't actually expose any devices out to you, which is also a, like a super important privacy uh, feature, of course, for all the devices out there, is that you need to at least activate a device and have something <laughs> activating that device before we will provide that information back to you. Uh, okay, so scaling this, uh, 
Sweden is a pretty small country, but still uh, a lot of routers. So this example here is that what we've seen so far is that each Wi-Fi device generates around 100 connector disconnect, like changing the state uh, on your Wi-Fi 100 times a day. Uh, well, that's 100 requests per day per device. Uh, in each home, we've seen so far that on average, you have around 11 Wi-Fi connected devices. So this adds up to more. I mean, around 1,100 requests per day. Uh, still not a lot, of, a lot of load. But as we scale this uh, to up, up to over a million routers, uh, this starts to add up. And all of this also requires write operations. And that's why we're kind of moving over to causal clustering. And this is only the traffic, this only accounts for the traffic that actually sends the update up to our system. Uh, the bigger uh, and the, like, the, the load that we actually need to build for is what all the third parties uh, integrates towards. Uh, so just on the router side, over 1.5 billion requests per day. But uh, we really like Kubernetes and we, we really like Neo. And with closure clustering, uh, they fit really well together. So as we scale this, we're doing a, we're doing a, a, a rollout where we're not, we're not pushing this to all homes at once. And then you want hosting that can, uh, can adapt to how many users you have. So we don't want to spec out our servers to handle all the requests that might come. We want to ha have servers that handles the requests that actually are coming. Uh, so with, with causal clustering in Neo, this is actually working out really well for us. And for, for those who don't know about Kubernetes, uh, it's um, an open source software that, that comes from Google in the beginning that uh, basically lets you create um, a cluster uh, to run Docker containers in. And, and you can do a lot of features within, you can do a lot of stuff within Kubernetes that actually fits really well with Neo. Uh, so some of the features that we're that we really, um, it's really good to have that works for us is that we can divide clusters into de development and production. Uh, that's of course super important for all of you guys as well. Uh, but how does that fit with Neo? Well, we can, we can also do node selection. So we have servers in our clusters. They're not all the same. We need specific servers or specific hardware where we want to run Neo. And within Kubernetes, we can actually target specific servers that we want to run uh, Neo on. And why is that important? Well, since we do this dynamically, we want to, to be able to make sure that all future instances of Neo also will end up on these type of nodes, uh, not only the ones that we've actually manually installed or something. Uh, another feature that, is, um, that works really well for us together with causal clustering is stateful sets. And what state, stateful sets in Kubernetes does is you can guarantee a certain order where you start your nodes. So as we want to scale up, we can guarantee that, um, that some nodes are already there and some, some instances of Neo are already there uh, before we start scaling. So just setting up like the initial cluster and then being able to scale the replicas up from there. Uh, Auto scaling is, of course, super important for us as well. Uh, what does, does that mean? Well, as, as the load increases, we scale up to more replicas of Neo. Uh, and what happens then is, like, at one point or another, you kind of grow out of your cluster. And the resources in the cluster isn't enough anymore. Uh, so then we actually also auto scale the servers. Uh, and so why are we using Neo for this? Uh, well, what we're looking at, as, as you see in here, it's, it's actually already a graph. It's, it's, and also the scalability is super important to us. Uh, and being able to scale horizontally without actually knowing what the load might be tomorrow is super important to us. And we have a data model that is constantly changing still. Uh, so just a quick look at the, at the graph. Uh, everything centers around the zone, of course. Uh, and to the zone, we tie relationships with devices. So probably the devices at your home will have a strong connection to 
the zone at your home. Then you run apps in that zone. So apps get a relationship. So Sp you run Spotify at home, or you let Spotify run for anyone in your home. Well, then Spotify gets a relationship to both your device and your zone. Well, then of course we have different zones. And other zones also run that same app. And, and devices might even go between zones. So like maybe you go visit a friend, you get a relation to that zone as well. And that's kind of how we build up that graph. Uh, and of course we have multiple apps. Uh, apps are related to other devices, uh, and the graph keeps on growing, of course. So, and what do we need this for then? Well, we wanna be able to ask questions like, uh, what other devices are running this app? Or, what kind of relation do this device have to this other zone? Or, maybe we even wanna look at predictions. So, when is the next time two devices will actually meet or be in the same zone. Uh, and when is the next time uh, you will get home? Or maybe even do some kind of black swan predictions. When is the first time you'll end up at someone's home? Uh, and of course, uh, doing business intelligence on this, uh, looking at when is the time you're most, uh, most likely to um, adapt a new application, for example. Uh, this is super valuable data to us, and this is why we use Neo. Okay, so to, to wrap up a little bit, I would like to uh, peek a little bit into the future. So, uh, Telia Zone is a consumer offering. Per definition, we are, we're a consumer brand, first and foremost, as, uh, the, as Telia is in Sweden. So from the consumer offering side, we, are, we want to expand and try to find new services that are very, very relevant. That's one part of, of the predictions. The other part is that we're also expanding this into an intelligence, like externalizing the intelligence that we gather as a B2B offering. That is the next thing that is going to happen very much down the road. So this is uh, just a, one graph of, uh, of a a subset of households where we have connect and disconnect events, so like people leaving, people coming. And the gray part is, maybe it's hard to see here a little bit, but the, the gray uh, striped part here is our predicted model of what is going to happen. So uh, people, human beings, are very predictable, it seems. <laughs> We've seen that just with a very simple prediction algorithm, we can quite, uh, well, quite accurately uh, predict when people are, for instance, coming or leaving or being home, etc on an aggregate. So just to give a glimpse into a little bit what a simple use case out of this could be, I'm taking one example of a food, uh, food delivery app. So this is like a home shopping app for food, so you just shop your, your things there and then you would, uh, oh, sorry. You would uh, uh, get a suggested date to when you can get this delivered. So my, uh, uh, my bag here would be able to be delivered 500 crowns, like 50, 50 euros, next Monday. That's usually what the user experiences look like on, uh, on these apps. With the premium zone technology or the Telia zone uh, uh, brand, we could enrich this quite a lot to become super granular and increase the customer value proposition even more. So in this case, uh, we would have a suggestion for a delivery time, which is over here. It says Monday at 5.30 in the afternoon because we could propose then to the delivery company or the payment company, in this case Klarna, give them this suggestion. We don't have to give them the entire graph. We don't have to give them the entire sort of like data set. We just suggest one time when we believe, when we believe that this person will be at home. It's of course on the, uh, on the, the user, uh, user has, has of course cons uh, made consent to this before. And when showing this to companies like the postal services and to other delivery services, they go absolutely wild about these ideas because they have had not had this idea, these things before. It's still on the customer terms, you still have to accept, but the accuracy will be very much increased and also the customer satisfaction. It's gonna be this like, delightful, surprising experience. This is just one example of what we, what we can do. We can also deliver very interesting 
uh, interesting insights. So for instance, we, we made a, a run on what, what was the Christmas present of the year. I asked the team here. So we had a few thousand zones rolled out over Christmas. So I asked the team, OK, so which new devices were activated after 3 o'clock? So 3 o'clock is usually when people start opening their presents in Sweden. So what, which new devices did we see activate after uh, after 3 o'clock, and then we made a, a, a cross-analysis to the vendors of those, those uh, MAC addresses. And we saw that, for instance, iPhone was 68.8% or something like that of, of all the new devices. So you can do like super interesting analysis of, uh, on the data set that we're generating that is totally unique and nobody has thought about in our business before. The, the last thing is, like let's call it a call to action. Maybe not in this sense, but I always show this. So the underlying technology can be found in all the descriptions of the APIs in this current form. It's found under the Premium Zone brand. So we, we have premiumzone.com. So we're positioning this as the, the technology. And we are expanding outside of our footprint sooner or later, for sure. We, we have inbound requests from quite a few other operators as well. So let's see where that ends up. I would, I would love for this to become some sort of, uh, some sort of standard. OK. That was, uh, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you.